Welcome to Flying for Flavor. I'm guessing that you're listening to this because you want to learn a little bit about food and wine from Northern Spain. So this is the first time I've done this format where I've actually just brought some friends together, put a microphone in the center of the table, and kind of recorded the entire evening. So I've only pulled out portions of the class that I think are kind of relevant to the topic. Uh, also because the class runs over two hours and I didn't think you'd want to spend that much time. But one of the things that I wanted to point out is that occasionally it'll sound like I am turning my head during the presentation and it is because I am actually doing so. So just picture a large map of the northern part of Spain behind me. And as I am speaking to the people in the room, I sometimes turn my head to go and look towards the map to point something out. So if you want to follow along in the show notes, you'll see a link and that page will take you to the show notes page. And it has a copy of that same map that I used during the class so that this way, when I'm referencing certain areas or certain wine regions, you'll be able to follow along. And while you're there, don't forget to grab those recipes and the wines that were referenced in the show so that you can follow along. So uh, it should be a fun uh don't forget, we are drinking while we're taping this, so I can't guarantee uh, that things will always make sense, but it was a lot of fun, and I hope you at least learn a little something. And I'm really hoping you're having a really good glass of Spanish wine to listen along. All right, uh, welcome to episode 38 of Flying for Flavor. Uh, we are down in my uh, tasting room today. It's the first time we've ever taped the show down here. Which is fun. Unfortunately, this might be become a habit. It's easier to get away with the one bottle of wine and you know, and a little platter platter of cheese snacks or something upstairs. But I could do this more often. <laughs> yeah. Well, every time I'm having classes or something, we can do yeah, we can do things more often. So uh, today, of course, we're doing a food and wine tour of northern Spain, partly to get my my and Norm's palate ready for what it's going to be like when we leave. I think it's June 6th or 7th, I think, because we're gone there for two weeks. But I wasn't, I wanted to get a little more familiar with some of the different wines from up there because most of the wines that we're familiar with, we know a couple of them, we're more central. Central Spain is usually where our wheelhouse is. That's where we spend most of our time. So this northern area, they have, there's a little bit um, of a difference here and there. Surprisingly, there's a couple regions that are really good in reds up in the northern part, which is kind of cool. So we'll go through all of them. Uh, so because you're listening at home and you're not smelling all the food, um, <laughs> check for on the uh, Facebook page as well as the show notes. There'll be tons of photos. So our entire boardroom table here is just full of food. <laughs> as usual, we made too much, but that's okay. Deke was a big help today, which was good because the other two girls bailed on us in the last minute. Uh, uh, so uh, just... So because we have some other uh, food and wine loving guests with us, uh, do you want to go around the table and say who's here? Mm -hmm. Oh, Deke just put food in his mouth. Do you want to go the other way? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to catch yourself. Hi. And Norm Pichet, I'm very pleased to be here. <laughs> Norm always sneaks in. He's usually actually in most of the episodes. He just doesn't speak. <laughs> uh, Bev Wills, happy to be here. Uh, Bev's shown up on previous episodes, actually one of the first yeah. few episodes. Yeah. yeah, so you might recognize her soothing, soothing voice. 99.9 on your iPad. <laughs> <laughs> you got to move closer, Bev, so they can hear that lovely voice of yours. Trina Talon, enjoying the wine and food very much. Oh, okay. Thanks. Ashley Sylvia, having a great time. <laughs> your weekly regular, Deke Sayer. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, and of course, uh, I'm Stephanie. Obviously. Okay, so uh, I was going through some of the food items. Uh, there are going to be recipes, and then I'll talk a little bit about pinchos. Uh, Norm's going to help me with some of the wine service tonight. I'm not used to sitting like this. Usually for most of my classes, I'm kind of getting up and serving each course. And tonight is the classic Spanish way where the table's just full of food, and we're just going to snack as we go along. We are going to serve the wines in a progressive order, though. Uh, meaning the white, we're doing one white, a rosé, and then three reds tonight. Cool. Uh, we did start off by welcoming our guests with a glass of cava, though, so I'll do a quick two seconds about cava for those of you who aren't familiar with it. Cava is uh, Spain's answer to champagne. It is usually made in the champagne method, meaning that it's a blend of grapes, and then it's aged in a bottle, a second fermentation, allows for some carbonation. It's exactly the same process, but they just use their local grapes instead. 
Uh, and these grapes are white wine grapes that are not usually, you very rarely will find them in regular wine production. They're kind of made just for that. So this is from the Penede region. Uh, so it's kind of on the west, east coast, close to Barcelona, to give you an idea. Oh, oh yes, for those of you who can't see it, there's a map I put on the show notes too. So the Penedes region, uh, so up in Navarra, so all up near it says Catalonia. We actually did a whole section. Um, one of the things about Spanish wine regions is that there's large regions. You'll see whole colors. And then within that region, there are smaller regions. So these are, uh, the English terminology is the um, denomination of origin, is, or DO for short. So uh, as an example, so all the green ones is the Castilla de Leon area, but within that there is Rueda, um, Roberto Duero, there's Bierzo, there's other smaller ones within that. So we're starting off with the, um, actually we're having the um, Rias Pachas, this is the uh, Albariño. So we're going to go far on the left hand side where it says, see it says Galicia, mm -hmm. up on the top. So the three grapes that are usually known for here, Albariño is the biggest one. They do a, do a Metia and a Godeo, but it's primarily, I think, 80% of the wine that is produced there is Albariño. So this is your classic Albariño. So it's going to be very dry, very crisp. Um, this is the one that's perfect with seafood. So even when you're traveling throughout Spain, you'll usually find an Albariño anywhere, and you can just ask for Albariño, and it usually ends up coming from this one region. So uh, Rias Bachas is named for the four little inlets you'll be able to see on the far end of the map. See, there's four little inlets that mm -hmm. kind of go in there. Mm -hmm. So that's basically what it's talking about is that those four little areas, there's all kinds of little towns and stuff in there. So we're going to be there. Um, <laughs> to go for the, to tell you the tour of where we're going to be so that you get an idea, we're landing in Bilbao, which is up in the uh, Pies Vasco area. That's the dark green at the very top. Uh, that's basically the capital of the Basque region. Uh, we've been there before, loved it so much. Uh, that's one of the reasons I think I wanted to go back and explore outlying areas a little bit more. So then we're renting a car and we're heading west. So we're actually going to <coughs> follow the coast along to Santander and Gijon and uh, La Carunia, which is up on the far um, western side. We're going to make our way down to Rias Bachas. So we're going to spend a few days there doing some wine tasting. And then we're going to head inland. So we're going to go across to that first green area called Bierzo. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to go into the city of Lyon, which is just to the east of that. And we're going to make our way back to the central part. So we're going to be in the city of Lagronio, which actually is almost bordering between La Rioja and Navarra. Mm -hmm. <coughs> uh, we're probably going to go up to Haro. That's one of Norm's favorite towns. Uh, we're going to spend a few days, a couple days there, and then we're going to head up to Pamplona for a day, which is the heart of the Navarra area. Uh, and then we're going to head north, and you can't really see it on the map, but just to the east of Bilbao, kind of right underneath where that word says La Rioja, mm -hmm. there is a little very famous town called San Sebastian. Mm -hmm. So San Sebastian is renowned for being having the most Michelin stars per capita, per capita in the entire world. Mm -hmm. So I think I forget there's like seven three Michelin three Michelin star restaurants and stuff there. Uh, it's not cheap, so we're only doing three big, nights. Big, big, big credit card. <laughs> big credit card. So it's um, but that's one of those goals. Like if you're gonna go to that area cool. and you're going there for food and wine, you go to San Sebastian. <laughs> All right, so uh, from that far end, uh, actually that one with the chorizo on it is Deeks. You, Deek, you want to explain what you have there? Yeah, it's uh, it's a homemade lebany, which is like a tzatziki, it's Arabic, with lime seared chorizo and uh, spicy micro greens. Uh, the one on the right is a um, fresh chorizo sausage that has been poached in red wine mm -hmm. with a little bit of uh, manchengo cheese, which is a classic, most renowned cheese of Spain. The one in, uh, in front of that is the classic tortilla española. So oh, it is so almost good. like a, oh, good, Spanish would be terrible, uh, angry with me for saying it, like a frittata. But essentially it's like a, um, an omelet that has potato and onion in it. And it's got a little sprinkling of the smoked paprika. Ooh. Um, the ones in the center 
uh, see where it says has egg and then tomato. So the ones on the outside are basically just almost like a classic egg salad, but very little mayo in it. It's more olive oil. Cool. Um, and then just with chives. And then the center one is the pen con ajo e tomate. And it is kind of like a bruschetta. Um, so got some garlic in it. The traditional recipe is where you would toast your own bread, rub the garlic on. Yeah, so I basically made it a shortcut version. And then those exactly the same ones are here on this tray, but with anchovies on top of it because that's oh, what's you. traditional. Yum, yum. Sweet. Yeah, and then, so these ones here that just came out of the oven, these are your uh, little cod fritters. And then there's a caper uh, aioli on the bottom, uh, just with fresh lemon. Uh, these ones here are um, paquillo peppers. Paquillo peppers that are stuffed with goat cheese and baked. So those ones are on little toasts. And then this last one here, of course, is more of that tomato mixture, but top with the classic serrano ham. So that should be enough to start. Oh, and I'm going to take it out of the oven uh, in a second. Um, I just had a potatoes bravas, which is uh, basically roasted potatoes with a smoky tomato sauce that's on top of it. Those will be just in a bowl, and you can just use a pick and put some on your plate. Sound good? <laughs> so this is a good time to give you the difference between tapas and pinchos. Okay, so in the majority part of Spain, um, meaning south of that northern area, tapas, so the word tapa actually means lid. So the history or the folklore behind the story is that um, one of the old kings of Spain back in the old royal family, I guess he thought he got sick one night and he thought something fell in or got in his drink. So he, after he got better, he decided to create a law in the land that every time somebody ordered a beer or a wine, they had to have some kind of food with it. So that's where the tradition, because of course they didn't have massive glasses like we're having here tonight. So the smaller glasses, you could put one of those on top of the glass. So that's how you were served it, or it was served at a small glass stemless. Right? And then they would put the little tapas on top. So that's the, traditionally how they were served. So you would always get a free little bite with your drink. But that's what, so it was law, believe it or not, one time. So those were free. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. It is cool. So then and there's other areas. As soon as you get a little farther north and in some of the bigger cities, they do have things called pinchos, and that's spelled P-I-N-C-H-O-S. And in those areas, they will have things similar to what we're having tonight, but... Some places, um, some places may have them free, even though they still kind of call them pinchos. They're kind of still presented like tapas in a way. Um, pincho is the um, is derived derived from the verb pinchar, basically means to pierce. Hence the little skewers and everything. So as soon as you get to the northern area, which is the um, the Basque region, so that's got a really French, there's a big French history and war and everything else that was up there. They speak a completely different language. They do speak Spanish there as well, but they have their own um, language up there as well, which is, doesn't sound anything like Spanish, which is wild. So up there, and they have a lot of X's in there. So they spell pinchos, it was P-I-N-T-X-O-S. So pinchos, so that anytime you see the X, it is pronounced ch. Mm -hmm. So the deal up there is that they will have trays like these out on the bars when you go in. And either some local intent, some people know which ones you're supposed to help yourself with or whatever. However, they are never free. That's how these bars make their money. But the deal is you're on an honor system. So you would take your little plate. You would take a plate if there were some stacked at the bar. Or if the bar owner was hogging the plates, you have to ask for a plate. And then you help yourself to what's there, but all of the picks stay on your plate, and that's how they know how many oh, you ate. Really? Yes. So, so the picks are partly to keep everything together, and they're also so that you can... So even if you ordered things like oysters, mussels, anything with a shell, the shell would also count. So it's just for once they I'm see like your plate. Right now, <laughs> <laughs> so there's some, there's similar there's similar dishes, just slightly different customs as to how they're served. Correct, slightly different customs. Uh, food wise, the ingredient wise will be a little bit different though. So the northern part of Spain in the Basque area, it's really heavier on seafood. So I didn't do as just because it's all along the coast. Fishing is huge up there. So there'll be more things like um, there's a brandad, which is almost like a creamed cod that's used as a spread. 
Uh, and then they'll put things on top of that. So you have this spread and then they'll put things on top. Um, they'll do things like the fritters, uh, shrimp, uh, cod cheeks. Uh, I was talking to them about that earlier. Lots of anchovies. Mm -hmm. uh, anchovies are really big. I'm glad to see people are eating the anchovies. They're fried, right? Anyone, no one's eating the anchovies yet? That was only me. I was, I was the only one. We're gonna try oh, nobody else yeah. take credit. Nobody <laughs> else take credit. I was the only one. Yes, we're going into the rosé. So I can do my little rosé speech. It's lovely. Yes, mm -hmm. it's lovely, eh? So this is, especially because if you're a red wine drinker, this is going to be a bigger body. Yeah. So this is made of the Tempranillo grape. So this grape is, I mean, some areas are trying to grow it outside of Spain, but it's basically native to Spain. So Tempranillo means early riser. Uh, so it's one of the first grapes to be harvested in the year. It's a red wine, it's a red grape. And the cool thing is, is that it, um, because it's one of the first ones to harvest it, they end up with a lot of it over the season. So this is the grape that used to be just for all the blends. So it would be with this Tempranillo with Cab, Tempranillo with Grenache, Tempranillo with something else. They always used to blend it. And, they're, and they started developing more and more and getting better at, okay, well, the Tempranillo, when it gets to... Uh, it's full ripeness. It has enough fruit in it. They can start using it for single varietals. So this is a little bit um, bigger body of a, of a rosé, but these guys are the champions. So my little shout out to Campo Viejo. It's uh, one of our favorite um, wines, um, favorite wine makers actually in all of Spain. And they're located actually just outside that city, that little town in Logroño that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. Uh, so the last time I was there, I did send them an email already saying that I'm coming back because the last time I went and I pulled up to the front of the front, their gates were closed. They were shut down for a private, there were some government dignitaries there or something. They shut the place down for the day. So I sent them an email ahead of time. I'd really like to come back and actually want to go in this yes. time. Uh, Spain's not like other countries or like our Niagara region where they have tasting rooms that people just sort of hop from one to the other, you have to, everything's by appointment only. Wow. So I've, wow. I've reached out to a few of them, but my goal is to get into Campo Viejo. So one of the stories is, is that we had never had Spanish wine before, and on our honeymoon, many moons ago, we were on a cruise ship, and one of the Sorry. wine... Your wine? I'm having a bad vision. <laughs> the wine steward, <laughs> the wine steward um, recommended this wine for us for dinner one night. And it was the Campo Viejo Reserva, I want to say back then it was, what, 2004? It was, anyways, it was an older, older vintage. Anyways, we liked it so much. It was one of our first nights. We actually, we cleaned them out. So it was, like, there was, by the last day or so, there was no, none of that left in the ship. So I actually made a note of it, and I went home, and I kept an eye out in LCBO. And so we've been drinking Campo Viejo ever since. You would find it in the regular listing section of your LCBO, so you don't have to go to vintages for it. Cool. So this rosé, I, I want to say it's ten, eleven dollars a bottle. Okay. <laughs> there you have. I you can this get. You brought back from Spain. No, but in, <laughs> that was <gonna> be nice. <laughs> honestly, it was gonna yeah. be like. Honey, so then you can get. Back. So then you can get also in that general listing section, Campo Viejo, um, because there's, they do such mass production, they can keep their costs down for exporting. So they also do. Um, you'll get a 100% uh, Tempranillo in the red wine. You'll get a classic Rioja blend, and you can get it in the um, the classic Rioja. I was gonna talk about this later, but I'll do it now. So if it just says Rioja on the bottle, uh, this goes for the same for Navarra because it's part of the Rioja region. It basically has uh, almost no oak time in it. So it doesn't really have much contact with the barrel and it goes kind of straight to bottle. It's bottled for a couple of years and then it's put out. So that's kind of way the Rioja would be done the same way or this rosé. And then the Reserva, sorry, Crianza is the next level. That one has like a year in oak and then it has another, basically a year in the bottle before it's released. And then it kind of goes up from there. So the next one is a Reserva, and the Reserva is going to have a year in oak, but then two years in the bottle, right? And it just goes up to the point where it's getting, all of a sudden, it's two years in oak and three years, it's almost five years in total wow. before it goes, before it's released. So that's what you'll see. And you can actually find some Reservas in the general listing section out the LCBO. So these are... A little bit bigger oaks. If you like those big reds, Deke, like yeah. the bigger reds, um, it will be um, best bang for your buck. You're still paying under $20 for the bottle of it. Not bad. But it's one of those wines that I always tell everyone, if you're going to go to someone's house, especially in the summer for barbecue, right, whether they're having like ribs or whatever, 
to go in there with a bottle of the Campo Viejo, especially the Classic Rioja, it's one of those wines that everyone will like because yeah. it's not too spicy, it's not too heavy, it's not too this, and it's yes, it's a blend, easy drinking. One of the cool things about Tempranillo is because it's picked early, uh, it, it's it got a little bit of a, a tartness to it. It has a little zip, so it gives you that tingle on the end of your tongue. So you don't notice it as much now. You'll notice it when we have Tempranillo coming up uh, in blends after this, but it, not so much in the rosé. But I'll find that it, um, it really accentuates spicy foods. So if you did have, um, actually, I, le- I left out on the table two different pimentons. So pimenton <coughs> is the Spanish term for smoked paprika. Yeah. So this is the classic mild one. That's what I sprinkled on top of that tortilla española. And then the other little canister that's there, it's the spicy one. Mm-hmm. So if you like spice, or if you're having like spicier wings and spicy barbecue sauce and things like that, uh, if you really like the heat, having something with a tempranillo will actually accentuate the spiciness to it. Cool. It says picante. She doesn't have her glasses on. It says picante on the can. You gotta trust me. I'm not like in this over forty business at all. <laughs> <laughs> Shall we read it to you? It's not our friends. You need to see you need that. <laughs> <laughs> flavor of light. That's awesome. Yep. Yeah. So did you get it? that. Uh, so the little jar is from PC. Obviously, that's their black label. Mm-hmm. The little canister ones. I get those at Home Sense. Mm-hmm. Really? So you have to watch sense. though because they'll have those little canisters and they they look ex- all the same. Some of them say mild or um, dote on one side, and then the other ones will say picante, which is a spicy. But aside from that, it's in exactly the same font, same coloring. The, mm. the canisters look the that same. That's too yeah. funny. Yeah. So it's got a little sprinkle thing on, so you can sprinkle it as you want. So if you can like the heat. Uh, I'm going through, so I actually wrote notes for this, so that's when you get some hesitation sometime because there's a couple areas or things that are new, uh, some of these yeah. regions, and I'm still learning like you guys are. It's a great phrase. So we did the Rioja. We talked about the Rias Bajas. So we're going into... Uh, remember I talked about Tempranillo? Sure, so oh, this okay. first red is a blend of Tempranillo and Garnacha. <laughs> okay. So Garnacha is Grenache in France. So it's used in a lot of blends there, uh, predominantly mm-hmm. in the central part, of, central part of France. So kind of around the um, Cote d'Iron area. Uh, it's also used in other warmer climates because it's a bigger fruit, right? So you have that big fruit Grenache and then that Tempranillo, which is that little bit of a zip. So this is going to be, an, it's supposed to be a really easy drinking. It's super awesome on a, the patio after work. Okay, you want it's red? bottle. Yeah. It's peppery. Yeah. Really? You know what? That's the, the Tempranillo. Bottle. Wow. The Tempranillo is that little bit of, you know, the end yeah. of your tongue, right? It's that yeah. little bit of a zip. I like you want to hear the really cool thing? Yeah. This wine is? Uh-oh. $4. $8 and like $4. See, even less. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really like it. Nice, eh? Yeah, it's amazing. I really do. Wow. So, yeah. Mm-hmm. So this is the uh, Condado Oro. So it is, I said, blend of Tempranillo and Granacha. So it is um, Castilla y Leon. So we're going to have to go through some back to the map for this one. So all those green areas again, right? So... This is, it's named for this area, so they probably, because it's not specific to um, the Roberto Duero, the Rueda, or Bierzo, when it just says the name of the region, grapes can be pulled from different areas. So the winemaker is just, he's got some grapes growing here, maybe the Tempranillo is grown here, Grenache is grown here, and then he kind of blends it wherever. So one of the cool things is, is that the square, this the area that this region accompanses, it's bad Sorry, wine's kicking you in. You got it. Yeah. Encompasses, got it. We know compared to the rest, compared to other communities in Spain and other wine regions, is massive. I think the actual, uh, so it's the largest autonomous community in Spain. So this would be larger than the Basque region up north. Um, it is the third largest region of the European Union. Wow. Uh, it's covering an area of over 94,000 square kilometers, and it's got an official population of over 2.5 million. Wow. So this is at the very old church of Lyon. So there's churches and a lot of historical sites. One of the other cool things that I read up on this place um, is that it has more than 60% of all of Spain's heritage sites are found in this one region. So all of the ar- architectural, the artistic, the cultural, the, the, the right? All of the historic stuff is all, 60% of everything in Spain is going to be found in this one area. Huh. So it's just a lot of history here, which is kind of cool. <clears throat>
Yeah, I'm going to the next one. I'm going to the next one. So this is one of my my favorite regions for red in Spain. He's a Rioja guy. I am a Bierzo girl. So Bierzo is uh, part of that. Um, it's the see up close to can see it. the Galicia area. How can you yeah. see that but not that? Eight. Oh. <laughs> Anyways, it is part of the Castilla Leon area, but it's got its own region. So it's up on the upper west side of that region, very close to the uh, Spacious region. So it is, uh, even though it is up north where they do a lot of whites, uh, this one area is just all about the Mencia. So in Spain, they pronounce the C with a th. So Mencia is how you would pronounce it in English, but Mencia is how they would do it in Spain. So this one is a grape varietal, and that this is the area it's known for. So there's some other reds in that particular area. So same thing with the wine we had before, they would also sure. make it there as well. Yes, thank you. So it's just, it's a little bit darker, but it's not overly heavy. It's still got a darker flavor, but it's not as heavy. Uh, so this is actually a 93 point wine for 2014. So it's actually really well rated. Uh, but most of the wines from the Bierzo region are going to be Mencia. One of my favorites is uh, Petalos. Uh, for those of you who like to buy by the label and how pretty it is, Petalos means petals. So it actually has a white label with beautiful hand, like it looks like watercolor flowers oh. on the front of it. So that's one of my favorite ones from there. So this is one is supposed to be even higher rated than the uh, Petalos one. <laughs> <laughs> Rogue olive pick. <laughs> I, I can truly feel like I'm in Spain now. <laughs> okay, so Bab, tomorrow we gotta go look for new labels. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's an easy drinking. So we did open this a little bit earlier. Um, I wanted to make sure they had some air in it to get it to breathe a little bit. So the 2014. Um, but it's it's probably the most authentic classic version of what a mencia could be uh, in this particular area. So it's just, uh, again, I think the most expensive wine you're having tonight is $25. Really? Isn't that awesome? Yeah. Mm. So it's, it's great well, which for... Which one's that? We haven't had it yet. Save oh, it for the end. Save it for the fancy, end. Fancy, fancy. Fancy, fancy. My budget, we already been through this, my budget is 20 bucks a bottle. Oh, well then you, you could probably duplicate this. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yes. But so I, you are now going to look for Spanish wines because oh. yeah. they are, like, yeah. you could get two bottles. I will. Like the one you had before that was $8. Mm. You could have two bottles and have yeah. change to spare. There you go. See, buy some chorizo. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> have like eight picks on your plate. <laughs> with counting all their picks uh, so, so I was talking about chorizo just because we mentioned it just for those who are not familiar with it so you see chorizo uh, in Spanish, Portuguese um, sometimes South American cooking mostly just Spanish and Portuguese uh, it might be spelled slightly differently it means the same thing so chorizo is Spanish for sausage essentially sure. uh, but it's in Spain um, more than other areas it is usually made with a lot of garlic and a lot of that pimenton, which is that smoked paprika. Yeah. So it's already in the sausage. So our local, if you're here in Sudbury, if you're listening from Sudbury, uh, Trini's actually makes it, they make fresh chorizo, so not the smoked kind that looks like a um, salami in the store, but they also make it um, fresh at Trini's all the time. It's always in their freezer section at the far end. We make a mild version as well as a spicy version. So this is the mild one that I did, that I poached in the red wine. Okay. But this is a great alternative when you're doing sausages on the barbecue and stuff during the summer, just to get a different flavor profile. So the cool thing about that chorizo and red wine uh, recipe is the fact that there's only the two ingredients. So you're roasting the sausage in the oven, just, just long enough on the outside that you can slice it. And then you're basically taking the slices and you're poaching it in red wine. Mm until it's cooked all the way through. So it makes its own sauce. So all of that garlic and pimenton um, that was in the sausage comes out into the red wine, and then the red wine takes its place. So you can either have it dried like this, where it's used in pinchos or tapas, or um, that same recipe, you can actually, I've actually served it in some of my classes before with the actual broth of the sauce that's left over. And it's this weird color because you get the color of the wine, but you see streaks of this orangey color from the sausage in it. Um, and I serve it in a ramekin with a big chunk of bread on the side mm. so you can dip the bread in the sure. wine after. But uh, I have to say, the leftover chorizo, if you chop it up and put it like in uh, scrambled eggs or something yeah. like that that are an omelet the next day, 
yeah, top notch. Cool. Last one. This is your Reserva. Remember we talked about Reserva earlier? Yeah. So Reserva means it's got more oak. So these are going to be your bigger Ritz. Yummy. <laughs> I have to taste it yet. Did you finish know. yours already? It. Yeah. yeah. Jesus. I'm talking too much. He's like, I'm done. My show's over, man. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a 2009, which is a spectacular year. So this is going to be a little bit more complex, a little bit darker. Is this... It's the third one. It's the lit. Third red. Yeah, it's the third one. Yep. So <laughs> it's a two thousand. That's a two thousand nine. No, it's a two thousand nine Reserva. Yeah. So that just means that it's had a little bit more time in oak, uh, a little longer in the bottle before it was actually I bottled. I haven't. No. Oh well, good. then dial it up. <laughs> you're, you're, you may want a straw. Yeah. Just let you know. Yeah. This is, this is Get to the bottle. Okay. No straws. So this yeah. is this is from Navarra. Uh, so that's just uh, to the east side of the La Rioja. Yeah. So in that little orangey area on the map. So their main three grapes are uh, Garnacha, which we already talked about. That's the bigger fruit that is well in, in warmer temperatures. Uh, Tempranillo, which you've already had. And they also are very famous for their rosés. You're not having it today, but they're very famous for the rosés. Uh, they've been doing a lot more red production, and I wanted to showcase, uh, because you already had um, a rosé, I wanted to showcase a red from that area and this one's actually getting a lot of rave reviews as well so the otazo brand has actually been exporting quite a bit lately so the interesting thing is is that garnacha is still the number one grape okay. in that area and then there's other grapes that are allowed to be produced and this producer decided i'm going to make a blend of the everything but the garnacha so this is cabernet sauvignon merlot and tempranillo i like it yeah, so it's a little bit easier drinking. It still has the finish of the Tempranillo, where it's the... Yeah. So there's things that happen within the hospitality industry or travel industry throughout the world that always kind of make the news. And so this is the time of the episode where I kind of give a little recaps. So get some discussion going of things that may be like jaw dropping or something you missed on social media uh so there's a really cool company actually in uh nova scotia it's called peace by chocolate so it was a chocolate factory opened by a syrian family mm. a few years ago and one of the cool things that they just launched they decided to make their own chocolate bar right now they were just doing boxes of chocolates right um they decided to make a chocolate bar that's going to be released to the public that you'll find in all kinds of stores just like any other chocolate bar they're actually using the Micmac word for peace because the Micmac, of course, are from the Nova Scotia area. So it's actually called uh, Wantankudi is the, maybe, hopefully I'm pronouncing that correctly, but it means peace. So they're hoping to launch the same chocolate bar and in 20 different languages. Oh, cool. So that you can buy <coughs> that same, and it is a ch milk chocolate and hazelnut bar. Nice. And it's going to, every single bar is going to have peace, and you're going to get it in 20 different languages is what their production is, which okay. is really cool. That's pretty neat. They're going to do Arabic, French, Mandarin, words for peace. Um, he's going to including indigenous languages as well, uh, hopefully by the end of the month. Uh, some proceeds are going to go to local and national indigenous organizations, as well as the Special Olympics Canada 2018 Summer Games. Okay. Nice. I mean, and one of the things about this, it's the Haddad family there that are doing this and they just feel like they're so grateful for being here in Canada and how they were so warmly welcomed and everything else and getting their business up and running that that's their way of kind of giving back to the community which I thought was cool. such a good news story yeah. Yeah. so I shared the link to the article um on the Facebook page earlier today but the sh um the it'll be in the show notes as well if you want to there's a whole global news thing or whatever that I clicked on that which I thought was really cool and then that was the good news thing. I should have started with the bad news and went to the good news. <laughs> hmm. So you remember the Starbucks craziness that mm -hmm. we talked about, uh, right? Where if you haven't heard about the whole Starbucks thing uh, down in the States. There was a two uh, African-American oh, yes. men went into a Starbucks oh. thing waiting to meet a friend of theirs to talk over a real estate business deal. Because they didn't order anything yet because they were waiting for their friend to show up first, uh, the girl behind the counter called the police on them because they were sitting in there and not ordering anything. Yeah. And she got suspicious and panicked and the police actually arrested them. 
and they got the whole thing on video. So that was a big uproar. So a couple of cool no, things. I didn't post, I didn't have this in my notes, but I did hear after that and I posted on the Facebook page. So these guys were smart and very sweet. So they negotiated with the city once it was kind of um, announced that it was all bogus and they shouldn't have been. As opposed to them raging on social social media or whatever, they decided they settled with the city for like a dollar for each. a dollar each, yeah. With the stipulation that a fund is set up of $200,000 to go towards an entrepreneurship program in that city. How oh. freaking cool is that? Wow. Yeah. That's that is, like... Yeah. Super fantastic. That is two guys that took a bad situation and yeah. they just made it like 10 times Absolutely. better. Like, good for them. Unlike yeah. the three guys in Toronto. Unlike the... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was just this? about. Like, I, I just about this fell stuff. over. Okay, I sorry. That's that. that's sorry. Ten thousand. Oh, you're going ahead of me. Sorry. What happened in Toronto? So up? so two thousand. I'm getting there. So okay. in back in 2014, three black guys decided they were going to go to a Chinese restaurant um, after they were, to meet some friends like later at night. It was not a bar thing or whatever else. The restaurant owner decided that she thought they were suspicious looking enough, or didn't think they had money, she wouldn't serve them until they prepaid for their dinner. Was it a buffet? No. So they uh, so they actually took them to the Ontario Human Rights Tribunal and they just got awarded uh, one of the guys who sued for them uh, $10,000 as compensation for his rights violation. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So anyways, it got, but it's one of those things that that just happened after the Starbucks thing and it's like, people, mm -hmm. and like, why does this keep, and it, besides the fact that it's bad that it's happening, it's in this restaurant thing where, I mean, you're feeding people, right? Have some common sense and decorum and has to do with training, right Bev? Absolutely. And it's all the people you hire. Yep. <clears throat> so the links for uh, each of those stories are going to be on the show notes uh, that you can, um, link and access or whatever and if you're not used to where the show notes are because you're slow and just catching this podcast uh now uh when you're listening to it on your smart device whether it's your phone or ipad or anything else you'll notice actually in the description of the episode there's going to be a blue hyperlink with the, where the show notes are when you click on that it'll take you directly to the facebook page where there's going to be the recipes i talked about all the wines that we're having tonight that you can link and buy them through the lcbo as well as uh, any of the links to the industry updates that I had today. Okay, so last little couple of closing things, and then uh, then we're going to turn off the microphone so we can get into the unedited version of the evening. <laughs> um, so the uh, links to the wines I said will be in the show notes. There's going to be three recipes. If you want the rest of the recipes, you'll have to sign up for the Flying for Flavor newsletter, which goes out in the first of every month. So yes, we just sent it out uh, for, this, for the month of May. Uh, but you can find it anywhere on the flyingforflavor.ca or stephaniepiche.ca. Anywhere it says sign up here, you click on it. And we are, I am very passionate about um, privacy issues and everything online. I do not spam anybody. If you sign up for that newsletter, you only get that newsletter. If you want to sign up for my I used to call it a wine newsletter. It's a drinking newsletter. If you want to, <laughs> if you want to get all the updates of all the uh, wine and other events that either I attend or hosting uh, throughout the year, you can send me send me directly an email. Um, you can do that at flavor at stephaniepiche.ca, and I will push you on that email list, which is completely separate. But again, I only email you once a month, or if there's a particular event, there's a last minute seats. But other than that, I don't email you for that. So you got to sign up for them because it's legal, and I'm a bit of a rule follower. Usually. Next week's fun. Next week is our Mother's Day special. Yeah. So the kind of cool thing is that we're going to get together and tape the episode next week, but we're gathering interviews with moms, uh, stepmoms. Uh, I'm a stepmom. Yeah, anything. To, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so it's one of those things that we're going to gather some interviews beforehand and kind of combine them into an episode. I'm going to try track down, tracking down my son and see if he can uh, uh, talk about life with me in the kitchen without... Him getting too cross. Yeah, he, he? Uh, 27. So he has a tendency, every time I've asked him to be a part of the podcast, it's so funny because he talks as much as or more than I do. 
but he's always worried that, you know, I'm going to go off on a rail and you're going to have to edit me. And so it might be an E episode. We can't guarantee that. Mm -hmm. However, he's got a lot of stories and stuff, and I think it'll be kind of a fun one-on-one. And my mother, who as soon as I mentioned the podcast to her, she starts getting all flushed and oh geez oh geez so she gets panicked right really yeah she gets very nervous it's, it's really weird that's cute yeah. right so uh anyways i told her i said i just want you to talk about stories about you know in the kitchen and you and your mom right like with my grandmother and mm-hmm. stuff like that so then she kind of relaxed a little bit into it so i will be getting um interviews with diana Nice. Uh, yes, Diana, the queen of the kitchen, uh, before uh, before next week's episode. So there's going to be a lot of stories. We're going to share some res- family recipes cool. as a group uh, and kind of just talk about why moms are important. I think that's kind of a, a cool thing that we're going to do for next week. And then, uh, and that's pretty much it. The rest of the schedule is uh, on the website, so flankforflavor.ca. You can actually see the upcoming episodes that are coming up if you want to mark your calendars for it. I have been posting them on all the social media channels. But uh, we need to keep drinking and eating, and we can't do that if I keep talking. <laughs> so in the meantime, so uh, just make sure to subscribe and rate us on Apple Podcasts. We're on Stitcher Radio. We're on Spotify. And as always, there's a built-in player on flagforflavor.ca. Mm-hmm. So until next week, peeps, cheers. 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 Salud.